Hello, everyone. I'm Florina Montanescu, and I'm a developer advocate. I'm Daniel Santiago, and I work on the Android Toolkit team. Room was created to simplify working with databases in Android by adding compile time check queries and an easier way to implement migrations and an easier way to test. But since 1.0, Room added more and more features. In Room 1.1, we extended the RxJava support and we've added the raw queries. Room 2.0 just meant a migration to Android X. But then with Room 2.1, we've added several advanced features like full, te full text search and views. But then you told us that there's room for improvement. <laughs> so then in Room 2.2, we've been listening to some of the features that you've asked and we've implemented them. So today, we're going to talk about what we've done in Room 2.2. Thanks. So since the beginning, Room has always given you the capabilities you know, to define uh, a DAO and a query and then get some uh, data back. But, and you've been able to do this synchronously in a blocking way. But Room also shipped with live data. And it was a way to get observable data set results. So if something changed underneath it, you would get a new uh, set of results, but it didn't have anything for like one-shot operations. That was mostly up to you. As development progress, we added support for Rx, and this was a complete story. You had types for both observable queries and one-shot one operations. Room also supports Guava, and this was a little backwards from lifecycle, no observability, uh, but there was one-shot operations. In Room 2.1, we started going the coroutines route and we added suspend functions. And these fall into that category of one shot operations. But in room 2.0, we added support for flow. And this completes that coroutine story. So you can have a full coroutine application. Um, but what is, what is flow? Let's, let's do a quick rundown on what flow is. Flow is basically kind of like a relatively new Kotlin coroutine primitive. Uh, the cool thing about it is that it's uh, lazy. So you emit some data, and there has to be someone on the uh, receiving side for more data to, to, be, you know, to be emitted. Uh, the API itself is split into two kind of operations. There's those that transform the, the data. Uh, they're intermediate operators, like map and filter, and there's those that consume it. Um, but let's see some code and some examples. So imagine we're making you know, the best puppy finding application, and we need to provide an API for finding some dogs and pet them. Uh, this has to be asynchronous because sometimes finding dogs uh, is tricky and might take some time. Um, we also have a parameter here that limits the amount of dogs we get. Um, if we were to build this, we would start with a flow builder. Uh, and the flow builder takes a lambda. In the body of this lambda, you write the logic to be able to provide that data, in this case, to, to get our dogs and emit them. The receiver type is a flow collector. It, just, it only has one function, emit. So the, the interesting part here is that that's emit is a suspend function. And it is, and it is because that means somebody on the receiving uh, end must be collecting the data before this function completes and your body continues. Uh, if we were to call this function, we use one of those terminal operators like collect. If we uh, execute this, we'll be getting a bunch of puppies and petting them, which is amazing. On the other end, if we did send, if we use a, a limit of three, we would only get three dogs, and three dogs is still pretty cool, in my opinion. In terms of room, uh, in your DAO, you can now basically have a query function that returns a flow, and uh, it will behave like expected, in the sense that you'll get a list of your result, but then it's observable. Uh, if we visualize it, imagine we have a room database. Uh, on the other end, we're trying to display our puppies. You know, when we get it, we get a list of puppies. But then if something changes on the database, like we download docs from the cloud, um, <laughs> you get a new emission. And this emission contains both the old result set and the new one. The cool thing about Flow and supporting flow and coroutines is that you can start combining it with the rest of the effort we've been doing with regards to coroutine. Especially, you can combine it with the lifecycle extensions. 
um, that will basically allow you to launch a coroutine. When the fragment is started, you can start collecting those stocks and start showing them, um, which is pretty neat. So <clears throat> you've told us that you want to be able to pre-populate your application. So whenever your users install your app, you want to be able to already display the best docs. So in order to do that, you would use a prepackaged database. This database would either be part of your APK or would come from a backend. So if you would have to implement this by yourself, you would have to do a lot of things, from opening the database, validating the schema, locking the database file, and a lot of things taking away from what you actually need to do, the features that you need to build. So in Room 2.2, we've added uh, two new methods on the database builder create from file and create from asset. So create from file will get as a parameter a file. This would be the downloaded file that you have. So one important thing here, you should make sure that you set view permissions on your file. So Room is able to read that file and copy the data. And then if you're prepackaging your database in your, uh, in your APK, make sure you put it in the assets folder. In terms of working with migrations, things are not very different. So in general, Vroom looks at two things. It looks at the database version installed on, on your device and at the version that you declare in code, so in your at database annotation. But now, with prepackaged databases, you have one more player. You have the, the prepackaged database. So when you're talking about migrations, for example, if the prepackaged database is version one and the one that you put in code is version three, Room will also have to handle the migration from version one to version three. So just keep this in mind whenever you're, you're working with prepackaged databases. Next feature is relations. So this is not something new for Room, but what we did in 2.2 is to increase the support for relations. So today, Let's do a crash course on what this means. So let's say that an owner can only have one doc. This is a sad world, but let's say that this is where we're living. So this means that we have a one-to-one -one relation between the owner and the pet. And this can be translated into database in like this. We would have two tables, a pet table and an owner table. And the pet table would also have a reference to the owner ID. For room, this means that you would need to create two entities, one for pets and one for owner. And then if you actually really want to enforce this constraint between the pet owner ID and the owner ID, you could use a foreign key. Okay, but how do we get a list of all the owners with their pets? Well, if you want to do this just using SQLite, you would need to select first from owner, and then you would need to select from pet based on the owner ID. So this would be put inside a data class, a pet and owner class that has the owner and the pet. With Roo, you would annotate the owner with embedded, and you would add the add relation annotation for pet. So while this at relation annotation isn't new, what is new in Room 2.2 is the fact that you are able to add this annotation to an object that is not a collection. So for example, here, we're just adding it to the pet, and we're telling Room that there is a connection between the pet owner ID and the owner ID. If you want to, uh, when writing your query in your DAO, you would just select from owner, and you would return the list of pet and owner. Okay, so we said that an owner has a dog. What if an owner can have multiple dogs? So this will be a one-to-many relation. And this is uh, mapped in the same way in your database. So you still have a pet and an owner. And then when we want to get the list of owners with all of their pets, the queries that you need to write are actually the same. You still need to select from owner, and then you, need, you would need to select from pet. But we don't want to do this by hand. We want to use root. So we will write our data class owner with pets, where we would still have the owner embedded and the at relation annotation on the list of pets. So here in the at relation annotation, we're saying that there is a connection between the pet owner of uh, the pet uh, table and the owner ID column of the owner table. Our query is simple. It's just select from owner, returning a list of owner with pets. Okay, 
So we have an owner having multiple pets. But what if a pet can have multiple owners? Well, in this case, we have a many-to-many -many relation. And unfortunately, this can't be expressed simply with two tables. But rather, what we need to do is to create a junction, a link table, a pet owner table that contains the IDs of the pet and of its owner. So the pet owner would be an entity with a composite primary key, the pet and the owner. But now, if we want to create a list of all the owners with all of their pets, things look like this. So first, we would need to uh, select from the owner, and then we would need to write a query that creates an inner join between the pet and the junction table. So this is quite a lot of queries to write for this amount of data. So now, with room, we can uh, write things differently. So we would still use the same owner with pets data that we've defined before with our owner and our list of pets. Uh, also annotated with embedded and at relation. But what is different is this associate by um, tag in, uh, in at relation. So this is the one that tells room that, okay, you should connect the pet and the owner based on this junction table, pets and owner. So now in the DAO, we need to just write our query, select from owner, and return the list of owner with pets. So this means that now in room 2.2 with one annotation at relation, we can support one-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-many -many relations. Okay, Danny, is there room for more features? Yes, yes there is. <laughs> There's more features. Um, another thing we added in room 2.2 was default values. Not coupling default values, schema default values. And you can define this in the column info annotation. There's a new property called default value. And this actually takes an SQL-like expression. So you can use themes like that current time time, which is a keyword on SQL-like. Another thing we added in room 2.2, or we made room 2.2, was a greater increment output annotation processor. And this is basically a, a change we did so that you can get some build benefits when you're continuously building your application. Uh, you have to opt in into this feature. It's an annotation processor flag. Uh, we want to enable it by default in the future, but we're in this phase where we're trying it out, um, hashing out any issues, so please try it out. Let us know if it works or not. Um, the last feature we had room for was uh, kind of like a long-lasting bug, or not a bug, but like a long issue of dealing with a sub-list of columns. So, Imagine we had this uh, entity dog, it has a bunch of properties and a smaller uh, pojo for it, um, which has a subset for it. If you try to query the dogs table, but return a puppy, uh, you will get a warning from Room telling you, hey, your query has too many columns, or it's returning too many columns that you don't need. And the reason this is happening is because we're using that star projection. With Room 2.2, we had a feature that will actually take that star projection and rewrite it just to the columns that you need. And you get that build benefit, that performance benefit, kind of for free. Um, we call this expanding projections. Uh, it's an experimental feature, uh, so try it out and <laughs> let us know uh, how it goes. Um, to enable it, you, it's, you have to go to your annotation processor options and also opt in via a flag. Uh, Expanding projections also tackles uh, the long-lasting issue of conflicting column names. And you could see this a lot if you try to do a join of two tables with, that had two columns um, with the same name. For example, here we have docs and owners, and they both have a column name ID. Um, expanding production solve this because you can define a pojo and you can use embedded with prefixes and if you combine uh, the prefix along with the SQLite operation to rename the table, then Room will figure out uh, which column goes to which entity and he'll be able to rewrite your projections so that there's no conflicting columns. Uh, so this makes it easier. Uh, for those queries with big joins that have conflicting names, as you keep adding 
more things, you can keep your star projection and Room will be able to figure out the rest. So to recap, we added flow support for Room that completes the coroutine story. You can go ahead and use Kotlin and coroutines everywhere. Um, you can actually also replace live data with flow. We feel um, it's a nicer API, especially because it has better error handling. Prepackaged database is a feature that's been asked for a while. You can have that too. We expanded relations, the annotation to have one-to-one -one and many-to-many. -many. Um, if you still have to do some pretty complicated relations, there's always uh, the fallback of writing your own queries. You get some sweet build speeds with that incremental annotation processor. Schema default values and expanded projections are also very useful. Um, so try it out, let it know. Uh, if you have any issues or problems, come talk to us. We'll be in the sandbox. Thank you. Thank you.